Good morning and thank you for joining us again at Palm Street Community Bible Church. It's always a pleasure to be worshiping with you wherever you might be. Uh, we're going to start ourselves out in a word of prayer. Lord, we have a message of love this morning. We come to you knowing that you love us enough to give your only son for our salvation. May we share this love and do it with a purpose in our hearts and not a false sense of pretense. We are the children which you have chosen them to be, and our obedience is the command of loving one another. It's the utmost high and the pleasure to give thee this service. We ask that you bless this service as it touches the hearts of many followers. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is risen. Amen. Thank you. 
assembly and the priest. These are all metaphors, these are all analogies that the New Testament uses to describe the church. That is to say, these are the metaphors, these are the analogies that God uses to describe you and me today. And he uses these especially in the context of relationship. But the metaphor that best describes the church is that of family. We see this in multiple places, Ephesians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 6, and many, many other places in the New Testament. One author writes, the word family speaks of intimacy, of care, of openness, and of love. Jesus said in John chapter 13, the new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. By this, all men will know that you are my followers, if you have love one for another. This writer concludes, love is the backbone of the family and of the church. Now, before I go any further, let me address the elephant in the room. For many, the very mention of the word family conjures up that memory. For some, their family memory is anything but the norm and not family. Instead, memories of family are filled with pictures, stories of abuse and addiction. As such, the, the image or the idea that the church is a family is too painful for them to imagine or lose. And I understand that in so much as we say that every family is flawed, some are more flawed than others, and some horrifically so. But rather than defining family from the perspective of a fallen and depraved world, let us be reminded of God's original design, his original design for the family is recorded Genesis chapter 1. It says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Chapter 2. Adam says of Eve, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And we see that they are walking with God, complete intimacy with one another and with God. This was God's original design. This was God's original design desire. But, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, sin entered into the relationships of that first family. We see that sin in Adam and Eve. We see it in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and murdered him. So sin enters into the picture. Sin enters into those family relationships. And the consequences of that sin have been passed down family to family, generation to generation. And so here we are today. God describes you and I, the church, as a family. But it is a family that has been permeated with sin. We read this in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 3. Know what Paul says about each and every one of us. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one, verse 12. He says, they are all gone out of the way, they are become unprofitable. There is none that do, does good, no, not one. Same chapter, verse 23. For all the sin and come short of the glory of God. And so sin has entered our relationships to the point that 
Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Moreover, if thy brother, if thy brother should trespass or sin against thee. And so we recognize that God's original design was for sin of them. But sin has entered into the world, and sin has entered into our relationships. And so how are we to respond to one another? Well, the Apostle Paul anticipates that very thing. If you will, open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter. Paul anticipates that sin will enter into our relationship. And he gives us guidance how to address that sin. Now be reminded, whenever we approach the scriptures, we want to approach it in context. That is, we want to consider everything that precedes our target text, as well as everything that follows our target text. And with chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, our target text, we need to back up to understand the context. First of all, we back up to chapter 4, verse 7, where it says, Exercise or train yourself into godliness. So the context is godliness in our relationship. Dropping down to verse 12, be an example, be an example to the believers, be an example of the believers in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faithfulness, and in your moral choices. This is what Paul is addressing to Timothy and Timothy to the church. But sin has affected those relationships. And this is exactly what Paul is going to address. How do we respond when sin impacts our relationships within the family of God? Well, he begins chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brothers, and the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. Just two verses. And typically I like to share an outline. I'm not sure how much help this outline is going to be, but if I were to outline these two verses, Paul addresses what not to do, he addresses what to do, and finally, who to do it to, and how to do it. There's the outline, two verses. First of all, what not to do. He says in verse 1, rebuke not. Literally, to reprove, to convict, or to reprimand. Now, although this is a single word in the original Greek language, I want to set aside the prohibition, rebuke not. I want to set, that, set aside that prohibition for a moment. This particular word, to rebuke, refers to a harsh, to a violent rebuke or reprimand. In a physical sense, it means to strike with a blow. The related word is used back in chapter 3, verse 3, when Paul is describing the elders, he says, not given to wine, no strikers. In other words, they're not prone to physical violence. But Paul is not addressing physical violence here in chapter 5. He's addressing, addressing verbal violence. And he's prohibiting it. He's using such stark language to get our attention on what we're not supposed to do. He wants to provide a significant, a startling contrast. And so he says, do not verbally assault, do not verbally and violently rebuke or reprimand. To be firm is acceptable. To be abrasive is not acceptable. And so he begins by establishing the parameters, rebuke not. Before we address the relationship, let's know this is what he tells us not to do. But what does he tell us to do? He says in verse 1, in truth. So before we consider the four uh, groups mentioned in these two verses, he tells us what not to do, not to rebuke in the sense of verbally assault, but he tells us to entreat, literally to exhort, to comfort, to beseech, to appeal. 
It communicates the idea of coming alongside someone. I think he best describes that in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Listen to how Paul describes them entreating one another, appealing to one another, coming alongside of one another. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, brethren. So he's talking about those relationships in the family of God. If a man be overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one, and do so in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, but that also be done. Verse 2, bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? Love. Love God love one another. And so what he does, as I said, is establish the parameters that when sin enters into our relationship, we do not verbally assault, but rather we entreat one another. We come alongside to comfort, not to compromise. We come alongside to appeal to them, to exhort them, so he's about to communicate four relationships or four groups of people. So, quick review, what not to do, rebuke not, what to do, to entreat, to come alongside, and who do we do this to, and how do we do it? Well, he mentions four groups. He says, first of all, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. This word elder, though the same word used later on in this chapter, verse 19, chapter 5, against an elder receive not an accusation, is not speaking of the office of an elder, but rather he's referencing older men. One commentator writes in this, writes this one. As a young man, Timothy was to confront sitting older men, but to do so with the same respect and the same reverence that he would his own father. In Leviticus chapter 19, it says, Thou shalt honor the face of the old man. Speaking of respect and reverence, Solomon in the book of Proverbs picks up on this idea of how we respect and show reverence to the older man. Listen as I read Proverbs chapter 4, these first four verses. He says, hear ye children, listen children to the instruction of a father. Attend or pay attention to so that you know understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He, that being your father, taught me also and said unto me, let thy heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and let it speaks of a relationship that is best described as one of respect. And so he says back in our text, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So that's the first group, the relationship with older men. The second group he mentioned, the younger men as brethren. In other words, the younger men as equal. We're not showing any sense of superiority, but in love and humility. And if you're looking for a biblical example of this, Genesis chapters 37 to 50, we have the classic story of Joseph. But in that story is the relationship between Joseph and his brothers. How they first wanted to kill him, but they sold him into slavery. And in those chapters, we read of all that transpired in Joseph's life. But towards the end of the story, Joseph was elevated to a position of authority. And so much time had passed that the brothers came to Joseph, not knowing it was him, but they came to him seeking his help. Joseph recognized. These were his brothers who had mistreated him. But Joseph does something very fascinating in welcoming his brothers. He does so with all humility 
and in love. Though he was in a position of power, he responded not in pride, but in humility. He recognized, according to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, that all that had transpired was in the providence of God. And as he gently rebuked his brothers, he did so not from a position of authority, but from a position of being equal. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. He treats the younger men as brothers. So that's the second group. The third group, the elder women as mothers. And we go all the way back to giving them the, of the Ten Commandments in, in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, it says, Honor, honor your father and mother. Show respect, show reverence to them. Solomon, once again, just as he did the older men, picks up on this thing. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of your father, and forsake not the law. Of your mother. Chapter 23 of the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 22. Hearken unto thy father, despise not thy mother when she is born. In other words, we, we are to, when a mother sins, we do not ignore it, but we come alongside with a tenderness, a gentleness, never compromising the truth. But in our approach, in our attitude, we show reverence and respect to our father. We show equality with our brothers, no superiority, and we show intentness to our mothers. Finally, he addresses the fourth group, the younger as sisters, the younger women as sisters. Now, the word sisters is uh, implied here very directly by the text. And he communicates that in our relationship, we follow the same guidelines as we did with the brothers, no superiority, but he does add one qualifier. He says we are to approach them with all purity. Going back to chapter 4, verse 12, that we are to live our lives as examples with purity. Now, why does he bring this up? Well, Paul understands the possibility of temptation. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Wherefore, let him that think that he stand, take heed, lest he fall. The next verse, there is no temptation, there is no temptation taking you, but such as the common of a man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above. Therefore, that you are able, but with the temptation, will make a way to escape. So Paul recognizes that in those relationships with the younger women, there is the potential for temptation. You know how Job handled it? In Job chapter 31, Job said, I've made a covenant with my eye that I will not look upon the younger woman. The younger woman. He, he makes it very clear. He understands the weakness of the flesh. And so he said, I made a covenant not to look upon my name, not to look upon their belief. And so when there is sin, and when sin has to be addressed, Paul says in our text, do so not from a position of superiority, but that of humility, and do so with all moral purity. Now, as I think about just these two verses, it's about what we do when sin enters into our relationship with the body of Christ. Now, to apply this, I want to take you to another passage, Ephesians chapter 4. Because Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, we're Timothy and pastor. And he writes this before he writes 1 Timothy. Ephesians chapter 4, listen as I read beginning in verse 4. He says, And he gave some apostles and prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. He gave those to serve. Why? For the edifying of its saints. 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ, until we all come to the unity of the faith, that we, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children. But then he says in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. And so he says, two commands. We are to speak the truth and we are to do so in love. Let me address both of those briefly. Speaking the truth. Truth is not relative. Truth is the living word, Jesus, and truth is the written word, the Bible. Therefore, what Paul is saying, he is encouraging us, and I think he's commanding us to communicate truth in our relationships with one another. And in the context of First Timothy, when sin is there, we don't turn our back, we don't ignore it, especially under the umbrella of grace, but rather we speak the truth, we communicate the truth according to the standard of the life of Jesus Christ and according to the standard of the Word of God. But how are we to speak the truth? He says, in love. That word love, the root word is agape. It speaks of a self-sacrificing love. A love that puts others before ourselves. It is a love that is unselfish. Let me give you a, a demonstration of that love and then a description of that love. A demonstration of that self-sacrificing love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest demonstration of self-sacrificing love is Jesus Christ. That's the demonstration, the definition, First Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4. Love suffers long, love is kind, love envies not, love bondeth not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself in secret. Love does not seek her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love rejoices not in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. And so Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, to speak the truth, to communicate the truth in love. And where is that most needed? According to our text, when sin enters into our relationship in the body of Christ, we must speak the truth in love. Let me summarize it this way. It's not enough for us to have truth and love if we do not speak. It is not enough for us to speak the truth if there is no love. And it's not enough for us to speak in love if we speak no truth. Now, I recognize that this text is a difficult text to assimilate, to embrace in our life and our relationship. The idea of coming alongside of people who are in the midst of sin and not ignoring them but gently, respectfully, coming alongside, entreating them, encouraging them to repent of their sin to return to Jesus Christ. This is not easy to do. And this is the reason why many Christians simply don't do it. But between our text and between Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, God has lovingly and graciously instructed us what not to do, what to do, and who to do it to and how. So we have no excuses today. It was said of the prophet of old that their calling was, and I quote, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And sometimes that's exactly my responsibility as pastor. To comfort the afflicted, but also to afflict. So if we are to deal with sin in the body of 
we must do so as a people of courage. We must do so as a people of conviction. And we must do so as a people of compassion. That is our responsibility to the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the clear teaching of your word. We thank you for all the instruction to Timothy, the instruction that Timothy would pass on to the church, just as I passed it on this morning. I pray, Father, that we would, with all humility, fulfill our God-given responsibility, not to look away from their sin, but to respectfully, with courage, conviction, and compassion, deal with that sin. Because, Father, if sin remains unchecked, it will permeate and weaken the body of Christ. So let us respond faithfully. Let us respond in humility. Let us do what you call us to do.